What does responsible political engagement look like for Christians? Christians, I think the goal of our political engagement is serving our neighbors. And I think we lose sight of that most frequently when we get caught up in just what's happening on the news, what's happening in national politics. So I often tell people from a Christian perspective, I start with my neighbors. I start with my immediate community and I say, do I know them well enough to know their needs? And do I have I researched enough what's happening in my local political context that I could show up at a meeting? I could vote responsibly. I could engage really well. And then that goes all the way up to national politics. But it starts with as a Christian, I am oriented towards the flourishing of God's creation, and that includes the most vulnerable people and the needs that they have. And so it starts with building relationships, and then it moves towards, okay, I, I advocate, I use my voice, I build relationships for the sake of those people in my community, especially those that are most vulnerable. One of the ways that Christians have used scripture and politics from the beginning of this country's history is an understanding that our human governments are ultimately subject to the judgment of God and that we are accountable to God for the things that we do with the resources that we have. We have failed in the past sometimes to know what God would have us do in our politics, but we have pretty consistently had this idea that what we do matters. It's not separate from spiritual life. It's a part of our spiritual life. We've also seen some of the greatest movements towards justice in our country's history have used scripture. So the beginning of the 20th century movements to provide protections for workers, to care for orphans and widows, were often motivated by Christians who said, this is what Jesus, this is what the prophets told us to do to care for the most vulnerable, um, including the civil rights movement, which used scripture often to talk about God's heart for the impoverished, for the oppressed, but really importantly, I think also to say, not just that God cares about those things and scripture shows that, but they often went to the end of the story. They went to the book of Revelation and said, Christ is returning to make all things new. And that return of Christ did not mean for them, we disengage from politics. Oh, Christ is coming to fix everything. So why do we have to put any effort in? No, they said, because Christ is returning to make all things new, to redeem and restore creation, to give us relationship with him and with each other that is perfect again, we then can work really faithfully for glimpses of that redemption and restoration here and now. And we don't need to be tempted to use unjust means to achieve justice because we know it's coming whether we fail now or not. We are free to work really faithfully for good politics here and now. And if it's impossible, if we fail, if it seems in the world's eyes like we have failed, it's not a failure in the eyes of God. We have the freedom to be faithful knowing that the results are ultimately not up to us. I think if you look across American history, one of the most consistent misuses of scripture that we have had is in taking passages that are either about Israel, about the people of God more broadly, or about the church, and saying that they're about America. So we have said from very early in our country's history that America is a city on a hill, a phrase that Jesus uses in the Sermon on the Mount to describe the people of God. So that's one thing is we kind of misapply passages that aren't really for us. But I think what's actually more common in terms of our misuse is that we use biblical phrases or ideas, and we've kept the phrase, we've kept the idea, but we imbue that phrase or idea with all of our own ideas, <laughs> kind of slip them in under the rug. So even this phrase, a city upon a hill, it's not just that Jesus wasn't talking about America. That's not even, I think, the biggest problem. I think the biggest problem is we forget that when Jesus called his followers a city upon a hill in the Sermon on the Mount, he says that only a few sentences after he says that the persecuted and the meek and the poor are blessed. So city on a hill doesn't mean what we've often in America thought it means, economic prosperity, military power. So we've often done things like that, where we've taken verses from scripture that in their context have very different values, have kingdom of God kind of values. And we have imbued without even realizing we're doing it current American cultural values to it. So we've taken verses like a city upon a hill or places that talk about if the if the nation turns and prays to God, then they will be blessed. And instead of seeing that blessing, which is in scripture as a spiritual blessing, a blessing of a flourishing community where the poor are taken care of, which is how it's often described in scripture, we see that blessing as it must, blessing must mean economic prosperity and military might. And those aren't necessarily bad things, but they're not the kind of things that scripture is talking about when it talks about what makes a flourishing, faithful community. At a time when our culture is more divided than ever, 
what is the most helpful way Christians should engage with others? I have one word that keeps coming up when I talk to people about politics, especially this election season, which is curious. Be curious. Ask questions. In the relationships that you have, especially with people who disagree with you politically, learn to exercise this muscle of asking questions before you jump to conclusions. So especially in an era where we feel very divided and we're often hearing messages that that tell us this, that say, your neighbors are very different from you. They disagree with you. They might even hate you. I think it's a really important Christian practice for us to say, I'm going to believe the best of people. I might be proven wrong. I might even risk being mistreated by others. But as a spiritual discipline, I am going to hope that there will be more unity than I expect. I'm going to hope that someone will treat me better than I expect. I'm going to hope that if I get into a conversation with them, I actually find common ground and not just disagreement. But we're never going to find those things if we decide in advance that they're not there. So when I'm in conversations with people, I tell them one of the best questions you can ask in a political conversation, especially with someone who's very close to you, if it's getting heated, if you're seeing the disagreement pop up, pause for a minute, take a breath, and ask the question, this seems really important to you. Can you tell me more about why? Because then you're getting to the heart behind the political argument. You're getting to the question of what we value and what we believe. And you're showing the person that you care about the relationship as well as the political issue that you're talking about. 